Dear friends, I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic and this is the 32nd edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. I hope you are doing well today. As you know, we are in the middle of our Kickstarter campaign. If you like the quality programming we are producing at Newsbud, please support us. Newsbud is a place where media integrity matters. We do not receive any funding from corporations, from foundations, or from government agencies. We are 100% funded by you, the people. Please help us continue and expand our work. Now, let's do what we do here, and that is discussing the front page news stories from major Russian newspapers. First today, we'll take a look at the front page of Izvestia, a moderate pro-government newspaper, the edition for May the 5th, 2017. On the bottom left side of the front page, there is an article about the traditional annual Victory Day military parade on the Red Square in Moscow. The article reports that this year's parade will be one of the most remarkable in recent years. A lot of brand new military equipment will be shown to the public. According to the article, this is the result of the sustained military investments by the Russian government, which has invested in the program of the military rebuilding 2020, 22 trillion rubles, which is about $370 billion. The article reports that in addition to the already seen new tanks T-14 Armata, the heavy infantry fighting vehicle Kurganets 25, the armed vehicles Typhoon, and the armored personnel carriers Boomerang, there will be on display new armored vehicle Tiger with the automatic fighting modules Arbalet. The Arbalet module brings together two types of machine guns, 12.7 and 7.62 mm, as well as a 30 mm automatic grenade launcher, AGS-17 Flame. This equipment allows the operator to hit both moving and immovable targets at a distance of 1.5 to 2 kilometers. In addition, another type of the armored vehicle Tiger is equipped with the anti-tank system Cornet D1, which uses two types of missiles, one of which has thermobaric components. These missiles can destroy an armored target or a bunker at a maximum distance of 5 kilometers. Another piece of military equipment that will be displayed at the parade for the first time is the new tank, T-72B3. These tanks combine the best features of the T-90S and the T-14 tanks and have been included in the arsenal of the 1st Guardist Tank Army and two army divisions which face the NATO troops on the Russia's western borders. The article notes that these two divisions have been set up recently under the direct orders of the Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu. Lastly, the Russian military will also display two new anti-aircraft systems for the special use in the Arctic, Tor M2D7 and Pansir SA. They are both mounted on the all-terrain amphibious vehicles. The Tor M2D7 is a short-range system and can hit targets at a distance of 16 kilometers 
and flying at the altitude of up to 10 kilometers, while the range of the Pantsir system is more extensive. In my opinion, the presentation of the new powerful Russian military hardware during the Victory Day Parade is meant to send a strong signal to NATO leadership in Brussels and Washington that Russia is serious, not only about defending its national sovereignty and territorial integrity, but also more resolutely than ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union, guarding its perceived national interests beyond the Russian borders. Will NATO leadership get this message and de-escalate the tensions in Eastern Europe and the Black Sea region remains to be seen. I think that what we will see in the coming period is even more NATO troops being deployed near or on the Russian borders. It could easily be that NATO strategy is to get the Russians into a new arms race, which would push Russia into economic bankruptcy and widespread social crises. This strategy seemed to have worked with the Soviet Union. However, this time around, it could be that the roles have been switched and that the Western European countries would not be able to keep up with the increased military spending, while Russia would be fine. The majority of the people in Western Europe are against the proposed hikes in military spending, and they would rather see their hard-earned tax money being spent on health care, education, and retirement benefits. This is why the most militaristic governments in Europe, that is to say, those governments most committed to the NATO Atlanticist geopolitical agenda, are likely to be voted out of office all across Europe and replaced by those political forces which want to see Russia as a partner and not as enemy. I predict that we will see much more of this trend in Europe by the end of the year and also during the next year, unless, of course, there is engineered some kind of a grand incident in Europe and then Russia gets blamed for it. Perhaps this could have something to do with the nuclear power plants in Ukraine. I have written on precisely this topic for the boiling frog posts more than two years ago in the article entitled A Nuclear Tinderbox in Ukraine. I recommend that you check this article again. I think you will find it worth your time. Next today, we look at the front page of Rasiskaya Gazeta, the newspaper owned by the Russian government, the edition for May the 5th, 2017. On the front page, there is a long article, actually a biographical story about Sergei Kramarenko, the famous Soviet military pilot and the recipient of the highest Soviet decoration, the hero of the Soviet Union. The article is entitled The May Stars and refers both to the Victory Day Parade on May the 9th as well as to the decoration of the hero of the Soviet Union, which has the shape of a red star. In the article, Kramarenko tells the story of his war exploits. What is extremely interesting and very curious in the present geopolitical context is that Kramarenko tells not only of his shooting down the Nazi aircraft during the Second World War, but also about shooting down the American military planes during the Korean War. Kramarenko claims that he shot down 
13 U.S. military planes, the loss of which was confirmed by the United States, and eight more, including two B-29 super fortresses, the crash of which he did not see, and which therefore were not included in his total. According to Kramarenko, he and other pilots, other Soviet pilots, were sent to Korea in early 1951 on a secret mission. They were not supposed to mention the location of their mission even to their own families. In addition, the Soviet military planes were prohibited from crossing the line of separation into South Korea, and all their operations took place in the airspace of the North. In this way, if they were shot down, the remains of their planes would, could be quickly removed, and the Soviet Union could retain the plausible deniability of its claim that it was not assisting the North militarily. Kramarenko mentions two specific instances when the Soviet planes devastated the U.S. bombers. One took place on April the 12th, 1951, when according to Kramarenko, the Soviets shot, shot down 25 U.S. B-29s on their way to bomb the bridge on the Yalu River, and also four fighters F-84 Thunderbirds, which were in their escort. The other event took place in October 1951, when, the, when in the period of five days, the Soviet fighters shot down 20 U.S. B-29s. Kramarenko claims that it was this event that made the U.S. command give up on sending the heavy bombers to the targets in North Korea. Kramarenko admits that he himself was shot down by the American fighter jets on January 17, 1952. He was able to catapult himself out of the burning plane and his parachute opened on time. He was rescued by a North Korean peasant and the Soviet military picked him up the following day. At the end of the month, Kramarenko returned to the Soviet Union. He claims that his military unit, the 176th Guard Brigade, was in Korea from April 1, 1951 until January 31, 1952, and that it destroyed 107 U.S. planes while losing 12 planes of its own and five fighter pilots. Kramarenko was awarded the decoration of the Hero of the Soviet Union in October of 1951, but he had to hide the where and why of the decoration for almost 40 years until the collapse of the Soviet state. The appearance had to be kept up that the Soviet Union did not take part in the Korean War. Whereas, as we can see, it was greatly helping North Korea and China against the United States. In my opinion, the key question here is why the newspaper owned by the Russian government decided to publish the story of the Second World War veteran who fought against the United States in Korea on the front page. Many other veterans are still living, and yet Kramarenko's story was given such a prominence. Does this tell us something about the Russian government's attitude toward the current crisis on the Korean Peninsula and the potential hardline U.S. response? I think it does. The Kramarenko story is actually a warning to the United States and the trigger-happy militarists in Washington, D.C. and in Brussels that Russia 
would not stay idly by while the U.S. bombs North Korea. What the Russians are saying between the lines is that just like the Soviets in the 1950s, they will militarily support the North. Of course, the official narrative will be the same. Plausible deniability. And yet, behind the scenes, the weapons and the military personnel will be sent. Therefore, as I see, the survival of the North Korean regime is just as important to the Russians as it is to the Chinese. And they will not easily let the country turn into one more U.S. satellite in Asia. The Trump administration should take this into account as it weighs the pro and con arguments regarding the military attack on the North Korean targets. My advice is just don't do it. Attacking a geopolitically vital buffer state is a horribly short-sighted decision. We'll stay with Rasiskaya Gazeta, but we will examine another edition, the edition for May 10, 2017. This article is on page 3 of the newspaper and not on the front page. But this time I will make an exception because I think that this article is very important in understanding the thinking of the Russian President Vladimir Putin and the logic behind his actions. The article is about Putin's visit to the home of Lazar Matveyev, his former KGB supervisor in Dresden, East Germany, on the occasion of Matveyev's 90th birthday. So it is clear that here we have the glorification of the work of the Russian foreign intelligence operatives. The photograph below the title shows the living room of Matveyev's apartment and Putin raising a toast to the former spy boss. The official title of Matveyev's position was the KGB representative in the East German Ministry of State Security, one of the most repressive domestic secret police forces in the world. Also in the photograph, there are two people who worked with Putin in Dresden. Nikolai Tokaryov, who is now the chairman of the board of one of the biggest Russian oil companies, Transneft, and Sergei Chemezov, who is the head of Rostech, one of the biggest Russian state industrial conglomerates, just by looking at the positions that the former KGB officers Tokaryov and Chemezov occupy in the Russian society today, makes it clear to what extent Putin's Russia is under the control of the KGB mindset. And of course, they are far from being the only ones. In fact, almost the entire upper strata of the Russian political elite, both in the executive and the legislative branches of the Russian state, has overtly or covertly worked for the KGB during the days of the Soviet Union. And so the scholars of Russian intelligence are right. We are dealing with the new nobility, which is just as powerful as the old Tsarist nobility in the Imperial Russia. There is no question that the political structure that benefited the most from the collapse of the Soviet communist system was not the people, but was precisely the KGB. For decades, the KGB supported the communists and pulled the strings from the shadows 
but then decided to come out into the open and take the reins of power in their own hands. This has especially been the case since Vladimir Putin became the president. Therefore, it should surprise nobody if I say that the logic of the Kremlin today resembles in many ways the logic of the KGB. It's the same people who think in the same secretive but cautious and complex way. No wonder that Putin decided to honor his former boss. According to the article, Matveyev seems not to have expected the visit and was visibly shaken when he saw Putin at the door. Putin brought him a typical KGB gift, a presidential watch. He also had with him the original copy of the Pravda newspaper published in the year of Matveyev's birth, 1927. To some extent, this is ironic, considering that Pravda is still being published, but is owned by the opposition, Communist Party of Russia. The newspaper is very critical of Putin's domestic policies, as the viewers of this show know well, because I frequently cover Pravda's front page stories. The article reports that in giving the presents to Matveyev, Putin stated, quote, We will never forget what you did for the country and for us. We will always remember it. End quote. In other words, the KGB operations have represented the crucial element of the Soviet power in the world, and Russia intends to build on that tradition resolutely and consistently. Indeed, instead of the spread of communism, the, illogical, the ideological cover for these covert operations and spy operations will no doubt be intense state-oriented patriotism, as well as the role of Russia in counteracting the Western neoliberal globalist projects. Lastly today, let's take a look at the Russian semi-tabloid press, Argumenti e Facti, the popular weekly newspaper, the edition for May the 10th, 2017. On the right side of the front page, there are the titles of several articles, which are discussed in more detail in the following pages of the newspaper. One of these articles is about the Russian national currency, the ruble. The title is actually the question as to why somebody is sinking the ruble. The subtitle explains that one dollar should be worth 30 to 38 rubles, considering that the current exchange rate is 58 rubles for one dollar. This means that the article advocates the stronger and not the weaker ruble. The article continues on page 21. It starts by critiquing the Russian neoliberal economists who claim that the ruble is too strong and that it needs to be weakened. These economists claim that a weaker national currency will make the country's exports cheaper and therefore more competitive on the global market. They think that Russia must follow this neoliberal economic course. However, the article brings out the perspective of other Russian economists who reject the neoliberal economic model. For instance, Professor Konstantin Adrianov claims that the weaker ruble would, would not increase 
the competitiveness of the Russian industry because most of the industrial production in Russia is based on the import of raw materials and technologies. In other words, the Russian industrial products would become more expensive and not cheaper, as claimed by the liberals. In addition to that, the rate of inflation would go up, and this would directly affect the living standards of ordinary Russians in a negative way. According to Professor Valentin Katasonov, who teaches at one of the most prestigious Russian universities, Mgimo, in Moscow, the lowering value of the ruble means that the government is essentially subsidizing exports. And Katasonov asks the question as to why the Russian government would do so. It is true that the export of oil and natural gas would go up, but the Russian economy is already over-dependent on the sale of these materials and needs to diversify its offering to the international markets, which it cannot do without strengthening the national currency. Katasonov claims that even at this time, the ruble is kept too low by artificial means in order to benefit those business circles closely linked to the liberals in the Russian government, which make money on the sale of Russian gas and oil. This oligarchic bloc is trying to push for economic policies that directly benefit them and their bank accounts and are not beneficial for the majority of the Russian population. That is the hidden truth of neoliberal economics. Only people at the top benefit, while the majority is getting poorer and poorer. However, what this article shows is that the voices advocating more people-oriented economic policies in Russia are also being heard and are being promoted in one of the most widely read newspapers in the country. It is clear that the liberals in the Russian government, headed by the Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, are losing out. And I expect Medvedev himself to be removed by the end of this year. In order to keep his popularity ratings high, Putin will have to run the presidential campaign of economic populism based on the stronger ruble and more government intervention in the economy. He needs to do much more to create real manufacturing jobs throughout Russia. However, at the same time, Putin will have to face a very hostile international economic environment. The NATO-friendly oil-producing nations, such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, will try to subvert the Russian economic recovery by lowering the price of oil. This then will make it very difficult for the Russian government not to weaken the ruble. In fact, that is exactly what is happening right now. This is why Russia must invest additional resources in quickly diversifying its economic production and also work out other ways and means to influence those in the international community that desire its economic demise and want to return it to the social crisis and the instability of the Yeltsin years. Dear friends, that's all for today. Thank you for watching. Please support our Kickstarter campaign and donate as much as you can. And of course, be cool and stay cool until the next edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor.
Hi, I'm Sabal Edmonds, founder and editor of Newswed, a 100% people-funded media. 15 years ago, with multiple invocations of state secrets privilege and several gag orders, I became the most classified person in US history, despite this thing called the Constitution. Why? Because without a free and independent media, the Constitution did not stand a chance against the despotic government. The solution was not changing the culprit media. It was to become one, one that would be independent by strictly adhering to the following principles. No funding from foundation billionaires, aka sugar daddies. No dependency on corporate advertisement. No affiliation with the divide and conquer partisan groups. A 100% people-funded media with integrity. Here at Newsbud, our formula is very clear and very simple. Investigative reports, information, and analysis delivered professionally, independently, and with integrity. We have brought on board worldwide recognized and respected geopolitical experts. Our technical team members work around the clock in order to bring to you impeccably produced and edited multimedia presentations. Now, let's meet some of these incredible Newsbud team members. Hi, I'm Brock West from Australia. I'm Jeff DeRiso from Texas. Hi, I'm Spiro, and together we are the Newsbud production team. Every day, we are working hard behind the scenes to create the videos you see and enjoy at newsbud.com. With our combined years of experience, we aim to create the highest quality media that our supporters demand. But we're only one half of the Newsbud production team. Together with our expert hosts, we are producing daily content on all the important issues that matter to you. Hello, friend. I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic. I'm the host of the weekly Russian Newspapers Monitor. In the show, I discuss the front page news stories from the major Russian newspapers and tell you what the Russian political elites are reading and writing. I'm Kurt Nemo, the producer of the Geopolitical Report, which you can find on Mondays on the Newsbud website. The Geopolitical Report analyzes foreign policy and other current events that the mainstream media refuses to cover. Hi, I'm Constitutional Attorney John W. Whitehead, President of the Rutherford Institute. Be sure to watch my new show, Battlefield America, every Tuesday morning at Newsbud. We'll be talking about the many ways in which our freedoms have become casualties in the police state's all-out war on the American people. I'm Peter Lee, and I host Newsbud's China Watch, which airs with a fresh episode every Wednesday morning. Watch it. I'm committed to reporting important news and perspectives on the rise of China and trends in Asia that are reshaping our entire world. I'm Jeff DeRiso, host of the show Mind Hack. Mind Hack is the show that explores the intersection between the workings of the human mind and the explosion of innovation in the fields of digital technology. So join me each Friday for Mind Hack, only on Newsbud. Newsbud also offers weekly special productions available only to Newsbud activist community members. In partnership with our supporters, our growing membership base continues to drive our reach, growth, and effectiveness. However, Newsbud's continued success depends on you. Make a stand and join the Newsbud media revolution. More than ever, alternative media is under attack, and that's why we need your help. It's time to wake up, America, get formed, get active, and stay in the battle. Please join me in being a part of the movement for real, honest news. It is amazing to me what Newsbud has accomplished in less than one year. Just imagine where we will be in one year from now with your support. Contribute to the Newsbud Kickstarter and join the Newsbud community. Support our Kickstarter campaign. Support is 100% people-funded media platform. There's corporate mainstream media. 
there are pseudo-alternative propaganda and agenda-driven news outlets. There are many junk sites delivering junk news. And then there is Newsbud, an independent and professional information source, a nonpartisan medium where people come together rather than being divided. You, our generous supporters and community members, are the reason we exist. You are the power that has kept us operating and expanding towards this amazing success. And you are the sole determinant of the continuation and steady expansion of Newsbot operations. Please join us. Join the Newsbot movement by kindly and generously pledging towards this 100% people-funded 